Welcome to this episode of the Global Innovators in Business series. In this series, we bring leaders and innovators from different fields to share their advice and experiences with undergraduate students to provide inspiration and motivation during the pandemic. We are so happy to have with us Laura Katz. Laura is the CEO and founder of Helena, which aims to be the first company to put human proteins into food. Through harnessing the power of precision fermentation, Laura and her team seek to create glycol proteins found in breast milk to help enhance existing infant formula, and in the future, open a whole new class of ingredients for food. Laura is also NYU's youngest adjunct professor in food sciences and technology in 2017, and was featured in Forbes 30s Under 30 list in 2022. Thank you, Laura, for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, Christopher. It's great to be here. So we always start with the first question, which is any nonprofit or NGO that you want to dedicate this interview to. Yes, so I'd like to dedicate the interview to the Good Food Institute, which is focused on bringing together policymakers like Helena and anybody in the ecosystem that is trying to improve the foods that we eat for the planet, for animals and for ourselves, and specifically focused on advancing alternative proteins, which is what we really care about at Helena. The future of a sustainable food system is going to require a lot of work, and the Good Food Institute is doing that great work to help us get there. Amazing. So to start off, what is the story behind the name of the company, Helena? So Helena is my great grandmother who immigrated to Canada, where I'm natively from, actually from Eastern Europe at the turn of the century, so the early 1900s. And she was fleeing where she was coming from and coming from really living in poverty, seeking a better life in North America. And she was just eager to live her life for her children and for other children by doing whatever she can. And so that was something that was so important to her. And she actually, ultimately, when she moved here, had a family and was later in life widowed and took over the family business. So she became a late in life businesswoman at a time where women were not running businesses. And so everything about her life was something that we wanted to dedicate the business to. So that's where we get the name Helena. Wow. And this was based in Canada. The business is still open. Kind of, but... That business is actually still open, not operated by anybody in my family, but it was actually a hardware store. And the hardware store was a, one of Canada's biggest hardware stores in, I don't know what I would imagine to be like the 1950s, 1940s. And it's still open today. It was called Canada Salvage. Even still equity at work for women today is not where it needs to be, but imagine a woman running that type of business, especially a hardware store, like 70 plus years ago. It's It was a very different time and she kicked butt in that role, which was not something that she had ever planned to do. So she was a pretty powerful woman and that was for us to name the business after her and for her to be able to even imagine where women are today and the technology we're building for their future is something that I think is really special. Obviously, we wish she could be here to see it, but different time. And 70 years later, for her to see that you're creating, the great granddaughter is creating the organization this amazing and this transcending, I think she'll also be very proud and is following in her footsteps too. Yep. Yes. So what's are you building that Helena? Absolutely. We are making the glycoproteins, which are a special class of proteins that have sugars attached. Glyco means sugar. And we're making the glycoproteins found in breast milk. And in breast milk, their primary responsibility is to help build the immune system. So we are recreating these glycoproteins in our lab and that's something that we've done and we've created a platform to do that so that we can be making the components that build the immune system for consumer products. So for products that people can eat and access that isn't just breast milk. We are starting by using the glycoproteins we make in infant formula. So we are creating the most human-like infant formula by putting in human glycoproteins 
No one's ever done this before. No consumers have been able to access these specific immune benefits from consumer products. They've only been accessible through breast milk. And for us, we really believe that the health outcomes for a baby drinking formula should be as close to those of breast milk as possible. And that's the future we're hoping to build. And from there, we really envision the use of these ingredients, these glycoproteins in all different types of foods where we can turn to food to manage our health in a much more focused way, specifically on immune health. And currently we do see 60% of people in this country looking to food to manage their health. And we are building the future of that here at Helena. So many questions on this. It's so interesting. Actually, could you tell us a little bit more about what are glycoproteins and why is that important in your body? 50% of proteins in the world are glycoproteins. Proteins are chains of amino acid that all get linked together. And then things can get attached to those amino acid chains. In many proteins that we found, 50% of them, they get these sugars that get attached to the proteins. It's important that these sugars get attached and that these proteins that we make carry that same structure because it is exactly that structure that helps to have many different functions in the human body that support immune health. So the glycoproteins in breast milk, where there are so many, some of them include antibodies, hormones, growth factors. There's so many different things in breast milk that are glycoproteins. They play roles in the body like balancing our immune system, improving our ability to absorb nutrients, helping to build our gut microbiome and helping to improve cognition. And these are all, as you can imagine, quite critical roles that we see for infants and not just for infants, but for all of us as we grow and develop. These are all things that we can hope that we get from our food. And so it's really the responsibility of this class of proteins that can do that. And to be able to make these through yeast, which is what we do at Helena, is a big unlock for the scientific community because until today, the only way to make these proteins with these sugars attached, glycoproteins, has been through mammalian cells or human cells. And human cells are really expensive to grow and make, and they require a lot of expensive inputs, things to feed the cells so that they can grow. And it's really difficult to grow enough of those cells at a cost that makes sense for food. And so to be able to use the technology we have to make these glycoproteins as food ingredients allows us to make them at a much more accessible cost so that we can be bringing the value of glycoproteins to all different types of people through food. Have we seen of any other products, a version of creating glycoproteins into something that we eat or something that we use? Or it, it, Has this been done before? There are some pharmaceuticals, antibodies, for example, and other types of protein-based therapeutics that are glycoproteins. 50% of proteins are glycoproteins, and we typically make those through mammalian cells, which when you're making a drug and you're taking like a tiny little quantity, that's okay. But with food that we eat a lot of every single day, every few hours, that's much, much more challenging. And then we find glycoproteins in other mammalian milks. So in cow's milk, there are cow glycoproteins. These are great. They're actually pretty valuable, but in cow's milk, the bioactive or the proteins that help to provide different types of benefits to our biology, these bioactive glycoproteins are found in the milk in really small quantities. So to be able to purify them out of the milk and use them as food ingredients is a very labor intensive, resource intensive, expensive process. So to create a solution that can bring a new category to the market, but also hopefully start to replace those really expensive and wasteful proteins from cow's milk is a really important solution that we can be bringing to the world of nutrition. 
Yes, I have not gotten to the stage in my life where I had to consider like what is most nutritious for my baby. So I quickly searched up why is breastfed milk actually really better? And the first response from Google that came from the CDC was breastfeeding can help protect babies against some short and long-term illnesses and diseases. Breastfed babies have a lower risk of asthma, obesity, type 1 diabetes, and sudden infant death syndrome. Breastfed babies are also less likely to have ear infections and stomach bugs. What is in traditional infant's milk that actually like leads this to be such a huge gap? I think the most important place to start is that a fed baby is best. And many people don't have access to breast milk, whether it's the parent chooses not to breastfeed or can't breastfeed. An infant formula is there and it works. It helps to feed babies so that they can grow and live a healthy life. But there are gaps between what we have in breast milk and what we have in infant formula. What's interesting about breast milk is that it is not a completely defined fluid. It's dynamic. It's constantly changing. And there are things in there that we haven't identified yet. That said, there are major consistencies between all parents' milk in terms of the glycoprotein amount, the amount of sugar, the amount of fats, and what the profile of those look like. And so that's something that we've learned from as a scientific community where we see specific benefits to babies. Right now, the conventional formulas on the market are using regular food ingredients like cow's milk, like corn syrup, like maltodextrin and corn syrup and maltodextrin are not in breast milk. So you're going to see different health outcomes for babies fed infant formula. What we hope to do at Helena is learn from what we do know about breast milk, specifically within the world of glycoprotein. So what these proteins help to do for babies, which is balance the immune system in many different ways and replicate that. So we can bring that to infant formula. We will never be able to recreate breast milk. That's not something that we'll ever be able to do at Helena, maybe until we figure out all the things in breast milk and we know what that looks like. But our vision is to bridge the gap and to start making breast milk's most valuable components that at least the scientific community has identified today. That's so interesting. So what started this entire process of your interest in foods, your interest in creating new types of food and at the end, what led you to Helena? When I was maybe like 11 or 12 years old, I said to my parents, my purpose on this earth is to feed people. It's a very profound thing for a child to say, looking back on it, I think that feels weird now, but at the time I was like, no, I want to feed people. That's what I want to do. I had a very early interest in cooking and I had a catering business when I was younger and I would cater family meals, big 20 person meals. That was just always my passion was feeding people. And I had watched Alton Brown on the Food Network for a while, who is a sciencey chef. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Like I could actually learn a little bit more about my food and what it's doing and I can pursue food science. So that's what I started with when I went to college. I did an undergraduate degree in food science, moved here to New York City after that to continue my education at NYU and did a master's degree there to learn more broadly about the food system and how all of this really comes together and started to make food products from there. So early in my career, I was developing all different kinds of food products from idea to lab, to pilot plant, to manufacturing, to shelf and every step in between. And I saw all of this innovation going into alternative dairy and alternative meat. And this category of what we use to feed babies and not just babies, but nutrition broadly was really falling behind in terms of where technology was going. And at that moment, I was listening to a podcast about the black market for breast milk. I was here in New York, I was on the subway and there were parents on this podcast talking about how they would go on the internet and buy breast milk from strangers. And the reason they do this is to try to bring the immune properties of breast milk to their babies where they can't or choose not to breastfeed. And the current infant formula on the shelf was not something that they wanted to use. And knowing, okay, there's all of this innovation going into food technology. 
can we do something here? Can we recreate what is so valuable about breast milk so that we can em empower parents with what they use to feed their babies and hopefully improve the health outcomes of babies at the same time. So that was where the idea for Helena started and my background in food science, of course, really informed, okay, here's how we can actually get started. Here are the technologies available to us and let's get this going. So that's the backstory of how it all came together. Wow, that's so cool, man. I think this is one part that timing is always so important for any startup. Like the first smartphone was actually created in 1994 called the Simon, but it was created by IBM and Bell South, but it was never really popularized because at the time there was not good enough internet, there wasn't a good enough ecosystem to actually make it work. So do you think right now is the right timing for this type of product in the market? Right now is better timing than we've ever had for a few reasons. There have been some really important food technology companies build their products and brands over the last five to 10 years in alternative meat and alternative dairy. And over that time, the technology has gotten a lot better. So it has gotten to a place where we can do this. And also we've seen a higher consumer interest and also uptake of these products. I always say we had to be able to do this on burgers or milk before we get to something as critical as nutrition and food for health. And we've really come a long way as a scientific community to be able to now focus on products that are high value, that are going to make an impact on our overall health in a way that we've never seen before. I would say that coupled with the formula crisis that we're seeing right now in the US where we have really dated and unsafe manufacturing environments for infant formula. And those facilities are making a majority of the infant formula in the US. And with that and the recalls that have been happening over the past almost year now, we've seen a devastation in the supply here in the US. and parents beginning to maybe not have as much trust for these long standing brands as they did before this recall. And so the opportunity to innovate here is it's really important because we need other people making products, making better products and making products that are going to move the needle forward. But we also know and we're seeing that parents are actually opening their ears they're really interested in what is coming down the pipeline and how they can be adopting new products where they may not have trust for the old ones as much. So it's actually a great time to be doing this. And we know that once we come to market, there's going to be a lot of appetite for the products that we're making. Mm. And I remember years beforehand in China, there were so many stories about parents like running to stores, trying to get like the last bottle of infant formula and then bring it back for shipping it from Australia to China. There's so many stories like this and it's almost like a crisis situation yep. for a long period of time. Do you think Helena had, after entire process is approved and many hurdles to come, but do you think the scalability of it will be able to help solve or address this issue? Absolutely. I'd say not immediate. Immediately we are focused on the U.S. market. We want to take this infant formula, but also all the products that we're making as global as possible. We believe strongly at Helena that we need to use science for good. And science for good means, okay, we've developed this platform to make these proteins that have such an important impact on our health possible. How do we disseminate our products or just get them in the hands of as many parents and babies as we can and improve health for so many different populations. Of course, that does come with expansion challenges and regulatory processes are different from place to place, but that's something that we are willing to take on. Someone's got to do it and that will be Helena. So we are really excited about the future growth that we see for the business and the impact that we can have. As you've mentioned, there was the melamine contamination in China. What was that like maybe in the early mid 2000s? We've had past recalls in the US as well. This isn't the first time this is happening and there has to be a better solution. 
what's the next step after? So this is not only just for infant formulas, but it's also creating glycoproteins that is for human health. So what is the step two of that process? What's, what else can this do? We see Helena's glycoproteins as the next calcium or vitamin D in terms of ubiquity. This is going to be in everything, but we can't start there. We are starting by using our glycoproteins in nutrition-oriented food products. So where you see any other vitamin or mineral or probiotic, something like that, we could be using these proteins. They are quite easy to incorporate into food products, flavorless. They don't have much of a sensory impact, but they have a big health impact. And so we are looking to partner with other folks that we could be using these proteins with, as well as making our own products. So there's really a lot of ground that we can cover, but we are always going to be rooted in products that are focused on nutrition and providing a really complete and wholesome nutrition product, food product, whatever that might be for the people who need it. And there are several different types of populations that we care about, infant health, elderly nutrition, sports Sports nutrition is interesting, the healthy adult, there's lots of areas that we're looking to cover. So we can quickly start like hopping between questions from our team and also questions that we received beforehand from audiences as well. First of all, does anyone else on the call would like to ask any questions? Yeah, I would like to know, how do you think about how we can continue to improve the opportunities and the equity for women founders and CEOs like you? Yeah. That's such an important question. We need to start early. I think when it comes to empowering women in whatever they want to pursue in their life, it starts in the classroom, It starts by equal opportunity for education. And then as women graduate and enter the workforce, it is equitable hiring practices at employers, equitable opportunity for growth at work, and then providing fair and accessible parental leave. We see actually a pretty similar trajectory between male employees and female employees until women start to have children. And that is where we start to see at that moment in a woman's career, a big deviation in terms of the opportunity for her to grow into a more executive type role. And if we could be held responsible as employers to provide better parental leave policies, childcare support, opportunities in the workplace for parents to pump. It seems like, okay, this is just a point in someone's life, but it actually is such a defining point in a woman's life for the rest of her career. And I think in starting early, but then thinking about a woman's journey through her career and just changing that whole system will have a big impact. And then the last piece I would say is we have to hold investors accountable for investing more diversely. We just saw, I think, a dip from maybe a little bit over 2% to 1.9 or so percent of VC dollars going to women. 1.9%. We're not going to have women in these seats in female-led companies if women can't get funding. So it's a combination of all these things and it's a lot to cover, but I do see a future where we could be making big improvements because female-led companies do perform better. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And how do you create this like process or mindset shift within the VC community to have more investors? If you were a VC, how would you find these talents or how would you push or, or try to build more companies in that space? If I was an investor... I would have a DE&I mandate for my fund. A certain percent of investments have to go to these types of founders and don't budge on those types of boundaries that you set internally because if you're not thinking about this all the time, 
and you're a VC whose job it is to pattern recognize. A VC's job is pattern recognition. I've seen this company successful because I've seen this type of founder come from this type of background, this type of degree, and it often skews male and white. And to break out of that thinking by providing requirements, mandates within a fund that says we have to be investing in this type of diverse population, I think is one way to go about it. Quite frankly, I've never been in an investor seat. I know that the decisions that they make are pretty multifaceted and complex from a where they put their money perspective, but there's got to be a better way to improve that process. I agree so much. Pattern recognition is based off of the therapy and pattern that's diverse and all-encompassing, but underlying data is sometimes very biased. Another question we have is, what is the regulatory landscape for this product? How would you actually make this value? We are looking at two different regulatory processes. The first is to create the proteins that we sell, these glycoproteins. We go through a process called GRASS which stands for Generally Recognized as Safe. This is a program that is run by the FDA to help new and novel food ingredients prove their safety before they are marketed in food products. And the process to obtain this designation called GRASS, or Generally Recognized as Safe, requires companies, manufacturers like ourselves to collect a lot of information about the ingredient that you want to sell. So this information includes manufacturing information, how it's made, information about how it's characterized, information about the safety, information about how it's metabolized and absorbed. You collect all of that into a dossier or into a package, and that is the one regulatory process that we go through and many other people go through. There's a thousand plus ingredients that have gone through this program with the FDA. So it's quite defined. The other process that we go through is for our infant formula is regulated uniquely compared to any other food. It is regulated as a food, but it has its own requirements. So for an infant formula to be marketed as infant formula labeled as infant formula, we need to have information about every single ingredient that goes into that product. They all have to be grabbed or have some other designation by the FDA approving their use. And then we have to do a clinical study data to show that this new infant formula product is providing babies with the same nutrition to grow, to thrive, is what actually every single new infant formula on the market, anything on a shelf in the United States has required. It's a very straightforward study. And it's something that I believe is very important and something the FDA does really well is require that we are really showing in clinical data that what we're making is allowing babies to grow successfully. So those are the things that we are going to be doing or we're actively working on right now as a business so that we can start selling our infant formula. How long does that process usually take? It really depends. It really depends. Running clinical studies, it, it comes down to enrollment and there's a lot of processes involved. We've started early in the process of ours and we will know over time how long it takes as we go through it. It really varies. I see. But yes, we'll be looking in the future for Elena's product on the shelves. And one question I had, most of the students, slash young professionals are like young mid-20s or early 20s and still looking for a career that's searching for impact, that's trying to do good and have a purpose in the world. And I know you figured out your purpose at 11, but... How do you recommend or how have you seen other people find that purpose and find that impact? You don't need to find it right away. I think that's really important is you need to try a lot of things to figure out what you like and what you feel really connected to. That's going to happen at a different moment in life for different people. It could happen when you're 70 years old. It could happen in your early 20s. And my recommendation is 
try to find a job where the day-to-day, not the idea of the job, but what you're actually doing day in, day out is something that you can enjoy. Do it with people that you like to work with. And if that doesn't work for you, that's okay. There's no one, we don't all have to be running to this kind of conventional idea of success right at the beginning of our career, things take time and really just try to explore what you enjoy doing and don't put yourself on a clock. I think that's really important. And what else would I say? I would say that I have NYU students that come to me all the time to ask for career advice, what roles they should be taking. A lot of my students work within the field of dietetics And they could be working in a hospital, they could be working for a big food company, they can be working really all over the place. And a lot of them don't know what they want to do. And so my recommendation is always find a role that you think sounds interesting. If you have the qualifications, even 50%, that's really all you need for a job. You don't need all the qualifications. And take it and see where it goes and take the opportunities. And if you have a chance in the evenings or the weekends to try something different. Maybe it's not a paid opportunity, but something where you're learning a new skill or being exposed to a new environment. Maybe that's something that you start to enjoy. So that's how I would approach it.